Welcome to a special edition of our talk. Today we are talking about reconciliation in the Reiki world. In the next hour or so you will hear everything about why this is happening, how it's done, and most importantly, you will meet the man behind Reiki reconciliation, René Feckley. Welcome back. My name is Daniel Straub. I'm an activist and moderator. And I'm also a friend of René Feckley. And it's a pleasure and honor to be here today with my friend, to interview my friend. René is a Reiki teacher, has been for many years. He's the co-founder of various Reiki organizations, and he is the man behind Reiki reconciliation. Um, and the source and the brain and the heart of it. Uh, welcome, René. Oh, welcome. You, you make me blush. Hello, Daniel. Uh, yeah, we, thank you for the opportunity. Correct, we can correct that in post-production. Um, with Reiki conciliation, René, if all your dreams come true, if it's massively successful, what does it look like? What is the outcome? Well, within the Reiki community, um, people will agree to disagree. They will uh, be respect respectful with each other, whether they like each other's opinion or not, whether they share the same tradition or not. Um, there's a lot of uh, uh, collaboration amongst organizations, amongst individuals, and the essence of it is that people uh, have created a realm within which they can truly live what they're committed to when they uh, teach Reiki, when they practice Reiki and live up also to the ideas behind Reiki. So that's the ideal world within the Reiki community. And uh, if we manage to do that, it will have a ripple effect on the rest of the world. Um, uh, other communities, be they the yoga communities, but not necessarily only in spiritual circles or in uh, complementary healing circles, but beyond in politics, in economy, it will have a ripple effect. So ultimately, um, together, we're going to win the Peace Nobel Prize. Very good. Um, let's talk about reconciliation, not just in the Reiki world, but generally, because I know you've become somewhat of an expert uh, for reconciliation. Uh, my question to you is, I mean, you know, I guess most people are for it, but where do you see the strongest resistance to reconciliation in general, not just in the Reiki world? Where, what are the, the biggest resistances? Well, <clears throat> reconciliation is always personal. And this is why I'm happy we're having this conversation. And I'm happy that you give me the opportunity as my friend to be speaking with you and uh, being with you. Because reconciliation is not something abstract um, out there in the world. It's always happening between uh, people. Um, and when we look at the dynamics of what happens in a process of forgiving, of reconciliation, one of the major obstacles I find is to truly speak tacheles, to truly um, accept that something has gone wrong, that I have been offending you in any way or trespassing or hurting you in any way. And equally, you admit towards yourself that you have been hurt, that you have been trespassed upon, that a wrong has been done to you. And this recognition is an initial step, which is very, very uh, major in my observation. And we don't have a culture 
where this has been taught to us. We tend to think of, okay, let's forget it. Let's go to uh, being together and pretend as if nothing happened. And if I may just add in this, in this point, there is one dynamics which I call the, the heroism of the victim. Now, I know expressions like victim or offenders or culture are very polarized, very harsh sounding. But for the benefit of addressing the topic and also to speak the truth, um, we need to have certain terminology. So let me just stick to that. And with the heroism of the victim, I mean the following, and all of us can relate to that. Um, when you have done something wrong to me, and you know it, and I know it, to some degree, I can hold that against you for the rest of your life. You know, in relationship, how people have the little the little booklet where they make little strokes about mm -hmm. how many times the toothpaste was not closed and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I can I can hold that against you for the rest of the life. It is as though I hold uh, a sword over your head all the time, mm -hmm. and it would mm -hmm. be my power to open the hand and let it drop like a bombshell uh, onto your head. And with the act of heroism of the victim, I mean the act of taking that sword away from the head of the offender mm -hmm. and actually symbolically ram it in the earth right next, next to me and take mm -hmm. ownership of who I am, what is right or wrong. And this, I find, is such a heroic uh, step which mm -hmm. the victim actually can contribute. And I find this is extremely liberating, but it takes courage and it is contrary to maybe many belief systems. Yeah. So if somebody wronged me in a, in a really big way, I mean, I don't want reconciliation because that means this wrong that happened to me would be erased. And, and that's not fair. I don't, I, I, I don't want that. It, uh, that has really happened. And to be true to myself and an advocate of myself, um, uh, you know what I mean? You know where I'm going? What, what can you tell me with, with, that, with that kind of uh, attitude or belief system? Uh, I think that uh, this is quite natural. And I also think it takes time. Um, reconciliation is a process. And it has different elements, and they're not necessarily in a chronological uh, order. Mm -hmm. They come at different times. Mm -hmm. So I think most of us, and no matter how grave the, the wrong which has been done to us, most of, most of us come to the recognition sooner or later that I'd rather be liberated of that ill feeling. I'd rather be free and not carry this in my luggage. So to some extent, um, it takes a degree of unfolding of consciousness within the individual um, to get to the point where he or she says, uh, I don't want to hold on to that which you described, Daniel. Mm -hmm. I, I, I want to release it. And that's the other step. Um, you know, forgiving isn't forgetting. Ah. Can you say that again? Isn't, <laughs> isn't, yeah. isn't succumbing to the other person that he is right or wrong. Quite to mm -hmm. the contrary. Mm -hmm. If I am truly in my own right as a victim, that's when I'm empowered to actually ask for reparation from you if you've done me wrong, to ask for an apology. And the risk I take is that you're going to give it to me. At the moment you offer it to me sincerely and you have regretted and we have agreed of, of some sort of mostly symbolic and oftentimes real reparation. The moment you, we've agreed that and you offer it to me, at the moment I take it, you're liberated of your luggage, but then I am also mm -hmm. forgiven and we are in a reconciled manner. That doesn't mean uh, that I haven't committed the crime. Uh, and that doesn't mean yet that you need to forget. And it certainly doesn't mean that you need to like me. But one thing is for sure, and there are such great examples, if I think of the uh, P. 
peace and reconciliation councils in the African countries. Mm -hmm. If I look at uh, some of the survivors of the Holocaust who are going to schools today as we talk, um, and they're, they're, they're free, they're, they're, they're not carrying that which you described anymore. Mm -hmm. And that's mutually beneficial. That's mutually empowering. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I'm still going through a process of learning to differentiate between uh, that that forgiving is not e doesn't equal forgetting that that uh, the past that there is still a place for the past, but it doesn't necessarily need to have the charge anymore. But I I I find that very easy in theory and quite hard in, uh, to apply in, in everyday life. Um, I would like to talk to you more about uh, reconciliation in the Reiki world, but uh, I would like to ask for an introductory clip before we do that. My name is René Vögtli. I'm a Reiki professional. Reiki is a healing and spiritual practice <coughs> which was established early in the 20th century by Mikao Usui. His main successor, Dr. Jujiro Hayashi, died prior to Japan's attack on Pearl Harbor. His successor was the 30-year-old Hawaii Takata, who takes Reiki from Japan to America. Today, Reiki can be found everywhere, in families, hospitals, even in prisons. When Takata died in 1980 without declaring her successor, she left behind 22 Reiki masters, baffled and without orientation. One of them was her granddaughter, Phyllis Furumoto, whom many recognized as her successor, and many did not. In the next decades, the Reiki community went through many tumultuous controversies which divided the community into several factions. There was hardly any openness for communication among them when I came to Reiki in 1991. With time, it became apparent that the protagonists need to disperse dissonances, let go of burdens from the past, allowing coexistence which honors, even <coughs> celebrates, our diversity. In 2014, Pro Reiki, a German professional association for all Reiki styles, awarded Phyllis Furumoto an honorary membership. Her acceptance speech conveyed a sense of openness for conciliation. The time was right to reconcile. Thank you. Um, so I think you met uh, Phyllis Furumoto several times. But tell us about that one time when you traveled from Switzerland to Arizona with the film crew and had a, a long conversation with her that was uh, uh, put on, on film. Take us along with you. What, what was going through your mind? What, what happened during that conversation? Tell us the story of that encounter with Phyllis Furumoto. It was the first encounter, encounter in Germany, which uh, I was very nervous about uh, meeting her the first time in person. Um, and she uh, was a very uh, powerful individual. Um, and there is a telltale situation at the end, and this is quite significant, at the end of the filming in Berlin then, uh, when I brought her uh, to the airport. Actually, she demanded I bring her to the airport. Uh, but being an old school gentleman, it was a matter of course that I would carry her luggage there. And she sat me down and that, she didn't want the luggage to be carried. She wanted to sit me down and look across, look across the table. We drank tea together. And uh, she asked me, why are you doing this? And uh, Daniel, I would have to do some thinking uh, to recount what answer I gave you, but uh, it's probably not very important. What is important is that she nodded and she um, invited me later, and that's what you started, to come to Arizona half an year later and do that second part of the filming. In the time between, I spoke to more than 100 
protagonists within the Reiki community. These are all people who had an opinion about the diversity and the dissonance within the Reiki community. And I, all of, I asked them all the same question. I asked them, I said, when I'm in Arizona, what would be the burning question you would want me to ask of Phyllis? So I had all this in my luggage when I went to, uh, to Arizona. Um, it was evident, two things were evident. One <clears throat> was uh, that it was clearly evident that Phyllis was the uh, leading light, the grandmaster, the lineage bearer for a particular understanding of Western Reiki, of one uh, version of the Usui Shiki Ryoho uh, tradition. Um, so she had to live up to that role of hers on the one hand, but I represented a lot of people who did not see her in that role. So that was one of the challenges I was facing uh, when I got there. And the other one, um, and now one has to understand the context of the whole video, which was recon a reconciliation along the path of mastery. That was the title of the movie we were about to make. So reconciliation was the central theme. And a lot of the filming in Berlin and later then in uh, Arizona dealt with the question, what went wrong? Right? We went off in many different directions. If you an example, she spoke quite freely um, about um, the role of her own mother, which is often forgotten in the Reiki community. We have Hawaii Takata, and then we, we jump to the granddaughter, to Phyllis, but there is a mother in between who had a say in this succession and uh, in this evolution. So um, Phyllis spoke uh, freely about that, and I'm very proud to have that uh, uh, historic uh, raw material of her speaking, for example, about her mother um, in the 66 videos, which uh, represent all the raw material of everything I did in Berlin and in Arizona. So that's the context, the reconciliation context. That, of course, included now the question, is Phil is going to see and admit that things went wrong, which she feels responsible for, either directly or indirectly, because there was a lot of ill feelings created or wrong things done, and let's not be judgmental about it, but observational, mm -hmm. um, also in her name. Mm -hmm. So that was one of the question uh, I had unanswered. Yeah. Is she going to admit What did that? she say? What did she say? Tell us. Um, well, uh, yes, she, she did see, and she went as far as naming names. Uh, and there were two major figures, and they're not at all the only ones at the time, and I'm speaking about the 90s in particular. There were many people, but there were two figures. Uh, one is an American gentleman by the name of William Rand, and another one is a German gentleman by the name of uh, Franka Chava Peter. Uh, and they, with the work they did, they were at loggerheads or vice versa to uh, uh, what uh, where Phyllis was. And um, she did see that um, uh, she and her organization um, behaved in ways she, and that's the other point, and that's actually the major point, she came to regret and she came to understand she doesn't want to carry any longer with her and she wants not only to liberate herself but also the other person um, and uh, the milestone of all the work I've done so far is actually to experience uh, Phyllis Furumoto um, apologizing on film for all the translations she made and which were made in her name and that was uh, like the starting shot uh, for the reconciliation we're called together to, excuse me, to take on a lively form.
Mm. Were there reactions to her saying that on film? Well, that's an interesting question, Daniel, because if, if you're asking me and you're asking me, uh, here we have a woman who has uh, apologized. Now, earlier in our conversation, we spoke about the different elements in the reconciliation process. So if I do something wrong to you and I offer my apology and I'm offered to make men's reparations, some sorts uh, or the other, um, are you going to accept my apology? And uh, if you're asking me, I think the Reiki community at large still owes a proper acceptance of that apology. Mm -hmm. In yeah. other words, some quarters still today are holding on to that which you described earlier. Mm -hmm. they, yeah. they haven't gotten to the point where they said, I disagree with what went wrong. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, but I still want to hold on to the, the victim's right uh, to be what? To be right? <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so this is a process we are in, um, we, the Reiki community. And mm -hmm. of course, it's, it's an illusion if I'm not thinking that uh, I can make a movie of any one of the people who are still around. And of course, I'm very deeply committed to using the opportunity of the people still alive today to go and speak to them and contribute that an interaction happens. But it would be naive uh, to expect them that they're sitting in front of a camera and say, well, I now forgive, uh, uh, I forgive Phyllis for and, and, and all the people who in her name have done wrong. That's, that's, that's uh, somewhat naive and yet Having said this, this is precisely which, what needs to happen, if not on film and with words I so theatrically now said, but it needs to be done in the heart of hearts. And I give you an example. Uh, I spoke two days ago to an elderly lady uh, who learned Reiki in the 80s uh, from Phyllis Furumoto who was skeptical about a lot of the teachings of Phyllis Furumoto, um, who, um, and I admire her for that, who later in life decided also to learn other Reiki styles because she felt that she can be loyal to both. Mm -hmm. It's like... Uh, you know, the definition of maturity, being able to hold two contradictory minds at the same time in your mind. Mm -hmm. um, and and she, she, this lady, is, is capable of making that bridge. And we uh, reflected how it was back in the 90s. And she said, uh, well, to me, uh, at that time, William Rand, whom I mentioned earlier, uh, was unacceptable how he, his practice of Reiki. And then she continued, this is a few days ago, then she continued to say, and you know what happened uh, recently? I received a phone call from a lady who wants to train with me to become a Reiki teacher, recommended by William Rand. So that's what's needed. That's, you asked earlier about the visionary thing. That's the kind of thing which 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 we can contribute in the here and now and which needs to happen to create that wonderful, wonderful, uh, fragmented, uh, beautiful, it's like a diamond with so many facets, our Reiki community, and each facet has its own right and its own color, and yet we are united as one and the same diamond. Um, and the interesting thing in my our talks in my conversations, which is one of the contributions I, I'm making to, to try to, um, to get people to talk to each other. Um, I, to, have, to whoever I speak, whether it is to William Brand, whom I mentioned, uh, or to our Java Petter, whom I'm also mentioned, I've spoken to both, or anyone else, some of the Japanese masters, masters, they have one thing in common, all of them. And what they say is, the energy, the Reiki, we all share the same. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, I think I uh, observed uh, 
and the de development within you, Rene. When I talked to you about Reiki 20 years ago, I think you you were more separatist and you justified that with upholding a standard for quality. Um, I'm Reiki Network and we have this quality. I mean, um, are you not worried anymore that under the label Reiki, uh, people are doing things that are not of good quality? Uh, if I pick up on your language, if I, uh, if I would worry about it, I'd be in contradiction with my own teaching because one of the important uh, teachings which we have is just for today, I do everything not to carry worry with me. Um, but I'm making a little bit light of your question. Um, and of course, first of all, how did I get involved in this reconciliation? And partly, uh, besides my biographical involvement in the reconciliation uh, process as a personal healing process, um, partly because, of course, like that lady I spoke about in the 90s, to me, certain people out there who did not comply with what I believe to be the best possible standards, uh, I frowned upon, I distanced myself from. And that was the zeitgeist at the time. I don't think it is right from today's perspective. Mm. Um, and, and the ill which was done, the disjustice which was done needs to be repaired, reconciliation. So where the change I've went through in the last 20 years, I'm still proud of the, of the teaching standards, my wife and I and my colleagues in the Reiki network and many other people uphold. I don't have a problem with that at all. Um, mm -hmm. And I can see that there are terrible things in the Reiki community, charlatans, uh, quickies, whatever. Mm -hmm. There is a joke I can make about that. Um, I want to be grateful to them. Mm -hmm. because that way I can differentiate myself. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and, and that's partly the answer to your question. I'm starting to, or I have matured into starting to appreciate and to embrace even that which I, from my subjective point of view, mm -hmm. uh, disagree with. Mm -hmm. But... If I speak to these people, I come to see the beauty of their personality. Um, and nowadays, Misha and I, my wife and I, are getting phone calls from uh, Romania, from Russia, um, uh, from other places where people are asking us, tell me, how do you give a children's seminar? How do you teach a Reiki teacher? And these are people I used to frown upon. Mm -hmm. So um, the maturity process, I think the community at large, because this is not necessarily only a personal achievement, mm -hmm. I think it is one we created collectively um, mm -hmm. at large has matured into coming to understand that each of these puzzles um, ha has a right to exist and deserves um, empathy empathetic, loving um, uh, approach to deal with. And mm -hmm. again, I don't need to agree with them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if people in Portugal are listening, and let's say they're touched by what you're talking about, and they want to get involved or contribute to uh, reconciliation, what can they do? Uh, thank you. It's a very good question because this is, of course, how this very special edition of the Art Talk came about. Mm -hmm. um, we are basically doing this on the uh, on invitation of the Portuguese community. Mm -hmm. uh, they're celebrating the 100 year existence, like many other organizations in the world, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, Reiki turns 100 years old, such a young baby, uh, in, in this year, 2022. Uh, such a young baby with such a, a, an unbelievable evolution in that context, it's a very young baby. Mm -hmm. um, 
and they decided to uh, to make a documentary and they invited me to speak about uh, what happened in the past, the dissonance which uh, needs reconciliation and so on. And this this is how this came about. So the very fact that they're listening to this conversation, that they've made it possible, actually, that they've invited you and me um, to hold this conversation, it shows their willingness to listen to other thoughts, to collaborate with other people, uh, to live up to a conciled state of mind. So um, uh, they're, they're, um, and I'm happy to, reconciliation is not an intellectual process. Yes, we can speak about different elements or steps and, and we can rename them and so on and, and, and put psychological or philosophical theories behind it. But at the end of the day, it's intimately personal. It happens on the heart level, not, not so much on the mind level. At best, the mind is just the entry portal uh, to get to where it really counts. Mm -hmm. And this is... This is uh, to understand this and to create an opportunity to express this, the heart basis. Um, and one short answer to your question, by the way, is everyone watching this video is invited to do their self-treat. Mm. That's the most crucial um, help or the most powerful, potent um, lubricant in the process of uh, reconciliation. So they decided to make a, a documentary about the past and where we are going. And within this context of a documentary, our conversation about reconciliation takes place. And hopefully you and I can transport the heart level because the title of documentary, at least to me, implies a certain historic truth. So I'm very glad that they're actually also inviting historians academics who have researched over many years and at great expense and um uh here 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 is a book uh by uh, dr yoyan yonker uh who who is also going to be a, give a presentation to our colleagues in portugal right here is a book i recently finished uh about the women in reiki often not getting all finished the reading or finished writing finished reading I'm sorry. <laughs> i wish i had written it um uh so so to give room to that kind of development is an important important question answer to your question daniel mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um you uh, do uh, art talks, you interview people around uh, reconciliation. So this must be very hard for you that to have these reverse roles where you have to answer questions and not get to ask them. And you have a lot of experience. Given your experience, what is the question I haven't asked you yet that I should have asked you? <laughs> okay. Well, um... Uh, you know, this is a special edition. We are talking about reconciliation. And in fact, our talk, the R stands for Reiki and it stands for reconciliation. Normally, these are the two uh, topics I don't talk about in mm. the R talks. Because if I speak to one expert of one style of Reiki about his style, Listeners who are convinced of another style may easily get triggered. And that's exactly what I'm not trying to do. To the contrary, I'm trying to have them talk to each other and not being in a reactive mood. So I don't talk about Reiki. And I also don't talk about reconciliation much because as we could feel earlier on, to speak tacheles, to be courageous and take that sword away from the victim, these are can be very, very heavy topics. Mm -hmm. And I'm using the R talks um, to meet and greet people of different walks of life, of Reiki life, mm -hmm. old, young, uh, black, 
uh, white uh, men, women, a professor, um, okay. street cleaner. I want to talk to everyone because every one of them is an interesting personality. And I would like to think that in those conversations, uh, we are, um, and that's the other thing, if I may correct you, Daniel, I don't interview these people. I go into a conversation with them. And uh, the two of us together are basically exploring one element of their personality, a certain topic. And that can be anything, uh, basically, but it will give the viewer an insight to this other person on the other side of the planet with a very different uh, Reiki tradition is and come to see, hopefully, if it works well, come to see they're no different than me. Mm -hmm. We are, we are, we are oh yes, we are not on the surface of things. We are not mm -hmm. the same at all. Mm -hmm. But take away that surface and listen to the person. May I tell you one of the highlights of the art talks? Yes. <laughs> so we have uh, reconciliation is only necessary if there was prior to that a dissonance, if people have been fighting, mm -hmm. uh, if there was polarities, if there was war. <laughs> So, and basically, there are three arenas of dissonance. Let me try and show you on the whiteboard. I'm making it, of course, very simple for myself and for us. We have uh, originally Mikao Usui. We have um, um, Tujiro Hayashi and we have Hawaii Takata. Then in the 1980s, uh, Hawaii Takata um, introduced 22 known um, Reiki teachers to the world by the time, these were the last years of her life in 1980. I hope you can see that halfway. Um, let me use a better color. So there were 22, and they, of course, ended up uh, um, teaching their own Reiki teachers, and this is how it started to diversify into the new era after Hawaii Takata's death. Now, you had basically uh, two um, developments, you could say. There is the Reiki Alliance on the one side, and there is the Reiki Radiance Technique on the other side, Barbara Weber Ray um, and Phyllis Furumoto on this side. And um, in the enthusiasm of the time, both these fractions had an idea that they did a very specifically and a very right thing, differenti differentiating themselves from each other. And that's where a lot of the dissonances uh, eventually uh, happened. Um, but let's just remember, this is also part of the zeitgeist, and this is an explosive unfolding of uh, Reiki uh, from 1980 onwards. So... <clears throat> There was a tension field created between uh, the area, um, between those two poles. And a lot of people in between said, no way, we're, this isn't in the spirit of Reiki, as Daniel asked one of the questions. Um, we don't want to um, get polarized. And to be fair, as time went by, the participants of these two traditions or schools they became more moderate, they became more flexible, otherwise we wouldn't be sitting here talking. And um, in this tension field, however, there were a few people, and in particular, I would like to mention Archava Petter. Archava Petter, who uh, released a very important book in 1997, which um, gave clarity, historic clarity, because he discovered the memorial tombstone, and he published it in 1997, um, which gave a lot of clarity about many things which until then were hearsay, legend, 
fairy tales to some extent. Um, and of course, those who believed in the recountings and in the value of oral tradition, um, they were somewhat provoked, me being amongst them in the 90s. Um, so our Java here, he basically, and many others, he wasn't uh, the, uh, the only one, he basically uh, decided he lived back in Japan also. He was married to a Japanese lady at the time. And he decided, well, there must be a way to um, find out how it was in the old days of Usui Sensei. And lo and behold, he, of course, uh, found, uh, let me use a different color, red, um, he, he have found uh, Mrs. Yamaguchi, who still um, knew Hayashi and who was trained by um, uh, Hayashi Sansei, and um, Archava started to uh, work with her. Um, this is basically the birth hour of what we call today Japanese Reiki. Of course, that's naive, because um, next to Hayashi, there were other... Uh, Usui didn't only have one per, one um, master he trained. He had a number of masters. <clears throat> and um, there we go. Uh, so I could make uh, a web here from Usui, uh, more than 20. And indeed, Hayashi had a number of masters and, and also women whom he trained as teachers. Uh, one of them was the Takata Sensei, and she, in many ways, was the most important one because she single-handedly brought Reiki to the West, which ensured mm, Reiki's survival to some extent <clears throat> because the remnants of those here, and in particular um, the uh, Gakkai in Japan, um, who to this day is the organization of Sui Sensei formed 100 plus years ago, um, is still around and alive. But the revival or the renaissance of Reiki was the product of um, Archava coming back from the Western world, starting to inquire, uh, Archava and some others, starting to inquire about Reiki here. And that's when a lot of the Japanese um, Reiki practitioners also became aware of the fact that Reiki was very popular in the Western world. So this basically is very primitively um, how you could say that there is a Japanese school of Reiki and there is a Western school of Reiki. So the three areas of dissonance basically are today within the Western community, there is still in the dissonance and, and, and clarity to be reached, but um, also amongst the Japanese masters or the traditions related and, and very simplistically uh, titled as Japanese Reiki, this is an era where an area and an arena where um, reconciliation by all means um, can still prosper. But also the, there is a dissonance between uh, those two, the Western and uh, the, the, the Eastern or the Japanese Reiki styles. That is why I'm saying there are three arenas of dissonance so I had a representative from a Western style, an elderly gentleman, Focke Brink. Uh, many of us see him as a dinosaur of Reiki, very strong, uh, very masculine. Um, and on the other side, there was a lady, a Japanese lady, um, representing Chikiden Reiki, the Japanese Reiki tradition. And she was more like a butterfly <laughs> in comparison to this to this uh, dinosaur. Mm -hmm. And the topic was passion, mm -hmm. okay? Now they shared the passion, and their passion was calligraphy. So mm -hmm. I let them talk for 20 minutes about cal cal calligraphy. And at one point I said, listen guys, I'm getting bored about uh, talking about um, uh, calligraphy. Um, I'd like to get back to passion. And as I said, I'm getting bored with calligra calligraphy. Those two people laughed at me, both of them. 
laughed at me with full heart, full throat, and in union. Mm -hmm. They were representing different worlds, but they were one in that moment in their laughing at me and my my sentence come on guys let's talk about passionate no calligraphy nice was example. it e was it easy to get these two people in a joint conversation or were they skeptical uh, for joining um they were not skeptical at all speaking to a representative of another school neither of them mm -hmm. they're very very open about that mm -hmm. which is your question suggests it, um, which which may be a surprise to many people. But that was aided by the fact that we spoke about calligraphy, their shared passion. Mm -hmm. But um, it was actually an experience and a half in how it came about, because I spoke to the Japanese lady uh, and we tried to explore. I was interested talking to her what might be a topic she is interested in, and she told me that she loves doing calligraphy and instantly i remembered Foke, and i called Foke an hour later sent him an email and the filming happened 24 hours later so neither of them knew each other neither of them uh, were prepared or could prepare themselves for the other mm -hmm. and both of them were a little bit apprehensive um you know uh, Foke what said to me but she's Japanese, you know, I don't speak Japanese. <laughs> and, and, and she said, oh, he does for how long? Should he, he does uh, calligraphy, 40 years? Well, he must be a master. So in their own right, they were very nervous to get to meet each other. Mm. And I think the art talks are such a wonderful opportunity to create the dance of this kind of conversation. Mm. And uh, I would like to think that's what happened there. Mm -hmm. Um, coming back to the topic of reconciliation in general, not just in the Reiki world, um, what is the most important or most touching uh, reconciliation story in your own life? Uh, that would be the reconciliation with my mother, um, mm -hmm. which which she spearheaded, which she initiated uh, with so much consciousness, but without the labels of reconciliation. Mm -hmm. And quite frankly, I didn't have those elements, those labels in my mind either. Mm -hmm. um, uh, life was very tough on her having to uh, give a birth to a 16 year, uh, when she was 16 year old, mm -hmm. I was born um, uh, very difficult time. She was in a, a foreign country. Um, it was a very tough time. And um, her mother uh, originally asked her to abort the child, to abort me. Um, and as a 16-year-old, she resisted her own mother in a foreign country. Pretty heroic. Um, and they made a compromise. I grew up with her mother, right? Mm -hmm. And um, to some extent, uh, my biological mother was never there for me as a child, as I grew up, uh, as a mother, and actually officially for, uh, for the neighbors and, and for everybody around us, she was officially my sister. It was a secret that I was uh, a child born out of bedlock, wedlock. And um, uh, it was apparent that my, my mom um, suffered from that, that she felt she had abandoned um, her child, me. Mm -hmm. So I was a grown man. I had my own children one day when I came home on our uh, little island in, in Greece. Uh, we were coming home from swimming and she saw us and she said, please come over, uh, Rene. And I wanted to take my children and she said, oh, I want to speak to you alone. And I went to see her and she had prepared a special chair um, and she asked me to sit there and I thought, what's going on? <laughs> and um, um, she, she knelt down and um, she apologized and asked me for forgiving 
um, mm -hmm. to forgive her. And my instantaneous reaction was to jump up and say, are you crazy? If somebody has to apologize, it's me mm -hmm. <laughs> for all that which I have done as a child and as a grown man to, mm -hmm. to, uh, against my mother. And uh, thanks God, um, I had matured at that point Again, thanks to holistic healing, which starts with the self-treat of Reiki, um, mm. to the point that I didn't follow my immediate reaction. And a voice inside me said, who are you, Rene, not to give your mom what she's asking for? And mm. uh, so that was, um, that was a, a very powerful emotional moment. Hmm. Th thank you for uh, for sharing that, and uh, and I bow to your mother for the courage to do that. That uh, um, yeah, that's amazing. When you first told me about your reconciliation work in the Reiki world. I, I wasn't aware of of uh, all the conflict and separation going on. And the reason was that I thought these big, these important Reiki masters, these personalities, I, I projected a certain wisdom on them. And I saw it as a contradiction to be at the same time, a grandmaster or whatever the title is, and in a pity fight about something. Um, can you comment on that? Well, something I often hear, and even within the Reiki community, I remember a very senior Reiki person when I, she, I approached her to be one of the first hundred protagonists to to help me uh, in my research and she didn't know me and she said how dare you ask this question i'm practicing reiki i'm at peace with everyone uh, so i said to her so what you're projecting onto reiki people or reiki teachers <laughs> uh, we ourselves project often upon ourselves mm -hmm. quite inhum inhumanely by the way and unfairly Mm -hmm. Unless, of course, I would uh, claim to be in full enlightenment, then it would be appropriate that you could expect me to, to be free of an ego. But until such time, and I can speak only for myself, until I've reached that level, uh, I am a human being. I have an ego. I have insecurities. I have uh, uh, needs. I have uh, a lot of things. And um, this was actually an interesting thing to come back to the story uh, I responded to her in a very rude way. I basically said to her, um, grow up, um, I don't believe you. And um, she was very upset about my, um, my response, which was not in the spirit of Reiki. It was not respectful to a colleague, uh, to uh, a more senior colleague, and also in Reiki, one of the teachings is to respect the elders. So I was in utter violation uh, because I was in a hurry, because I, whatever. And um, uh, she reprimanded me very strongly. And she put me very strongly into a place. And that was the end of that conversation. We, we, I never was able to enter a conversation with her. Yeah. Uh, this was seven years ago. I spoke to her last week. Good for you. Mm -hmm. And for her. And for her. Yes. Yeah. 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 So, so yes, uh, that seems to be like in contradiction that we are, uh, we are preaching water and we're drinking wine, that we are pretending to be another, even towards ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think uh, it's fair to say, and I'm making somewhat of a loop to the Peace Nobel Prize, uh, I, th <laughs> I think it is somewhat fair to say that um, there is a lot of um, consciousness 
an awareness of that very contradiction, that we are aspiring to live up to something which by pure definition, we are almost do, doomed to fail. Mm. You know, uh, as long as we haven't reached that level yet, uh, we are doomed to, 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 to also to. So it's maybe comparable with, uh, with a spiral uh, that uh, you're making loops and loops and loops and loops, and it appears that you're running in a circle. But if you look at it from the side, you can maybe see that each time you were and if it is only a millimeter higher than the last. So mm -hmm. um, uh, I think that more and more people in the Reiki community are conscious of um, the potential and of the needs that we need to talk to each other, that we need to respect each other, that we need to overcome our own, uh, own ego-driven or insecurity-influenced um, behavior. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, and uh, if reconciliation is successful, it's um, it just benefits everybody. Yeah. Uh, so I'm I'm grateful for the work that you're doing, and um, I'm uh, um, sure about the, the the ripples and and that it's uh, going beyond uh has an effect beyond the work uh, that you are doing and uh, the people are doing you're talking to um to uh close this session i would like uh to give the uh, baton over to felix furumoto that maybe have a an excerpt from from your conversation to close our our session, I think that would be a good way to honor her contribution to reconciliation. Okay. Um. Thank and, and thank you, Rene, for. May, if I may, you ask me what's the question you forgot to ask. Um, you, um, uh, there's one element, if if I may, just. Mm -hmm. um, so let's do it. Let's do it. Maybe take a deep breath, and then we go. We go to your element, okay? Or to to the video or to the question? No, to to the element that I that you want to bring up. Okay. Yes. You know, recently. Um, with the fragmentation as it has happened and as it's accelerating through the internet and uh, also through the current situation with, with uh, people not physically being able to talk to each other. Um, at one point in time, somebody said, is it necessary still to, to think about reconciliation and making an effort um, or, or can we can we let it go now because some of the people of the past have died and it's so multifaceted nowadays and i thought deeply about that and there was a voice in me which very strongly said um and and this is as recent as last fall 2021 um there was a, a voice in me which said yeah maybe Maybe, maybe, maybe all the work I'm doing right now can can be stopped. Can be we can make a celebration. It's a good year, hundred years Reiki. Um, but then things happened on various levels out there in the world. I'm thinking now of uh, Kazakhstan of what's happening in the Ukraine as we talk today. I'm thinking of what happens within families, within societies triggered by the corona situation. And I'm also privy to what happens within uh, a number of organizations now, this year. It hasn't happened in November. It's happening now, this year. And it appears to me that on many levels, war is underway 
chaos is rampant everywhere. Uh, uh, the loss of orientation is everywhere. And I came to the conclusion now more than ever, it is important that holistic healing and with that reconciliation is an important part. It may mean that we have to let go of old ideas and all paradigms and all belief systems in a very radical way. Hopefully we can do it together in collaboration by dismantling things, deconstruct organizations, and uh, take enough time to reflect what is it that I can learn from the past? What is it I need for the future? And how can I reassemble whatever I've created so far so it's promising for the future, not only of me and my generation, but of the generations to come. And to me, the picture of the phoenix, which arises from the ashes. And I think that's very much like a motto of where I am with my reconciliation work today. Thank you for your work and thanks for talking to me. Let's have a look at the video. With all this momentum and moving into the future, it is clear to me that Reiki is saying, okay, now you're ready for the big picture. You know, the world is not about mommy and daddy, my Reiki master, my lineage. It's about our Reiki. It's about our gift to humanity. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, dear viewers, um, uh, I turn the tables again from Daniel. I'd like to thank you, Daniel, for having taken the role as a host. Um, You're welcome. Daniel is not only a friend, he is also a uh, coach, a uh, quite radical activist in many ways. Uh, somebody I really enjoy also because he gives me and open stores. He gives me insights into things outside of the Reiki community, which I'd like to think I can bring into my work and into the Reiki community. So thank you very much, Daniel. Regards to our friends in Portugal, I say um, goodbye to you, Daniel. Thank you very much. Take care.